protest movement is stoking fear and anger. Their fight is against the next generation of wireless technology, 5G, that's predicted to change our lives. And this is going to allow a whole revolution in the way we live and organise ourselves. It's going to really change the world because 5G can do things that 4G could never do. It really is going to be a game changer. Despite its extraordinary promise, the opposition to 5G has in some places turned violent. It's fueled wild conspiracy theories that have quickly spilled from online into the real world. 5G burning bro. And there are much bigger forces at play. I think we'd be naive if we did not recognise the possibility that some of these claims are being generated uh, by uh, hostile governments. While protesters rail against 5G spread, a greater threat is looming, a global technology war. The race to 5G is a race America must win. It's a race that we will win. Tonight on Four Corners, we investigate what's behind the growing backlash against 5G and why the world's superpowers are vying for 5G dominance. It's a crisp winter's morning in the town of Mullumbimby its vibrant mix of locals, backpackers and transient hippies, it's known as the counterculture capital of the New South Wales North Coast. Mullumbimby is a very diverse community. There's a very alternative vibe here. A lot of people that have a very deep mistrust of government, very health oriented. And so a lot of organic health foods here, anti-GMO, big anti-fracking movement. It's probably the, the anti-vax capital of Australia, if, if not the Western world. Today, they're gathering for a protest. There's a grab bag of complaints. But most of the people are here to protest against 5G. First thing I wanted to say was, stop 5G! Stop 5G! Stop 5G! Stop 5G! Stop 5G! Let's walk! <laughs> They're heading for Mullumbimby's lone telecommunications tower. For months, protesters have targeted this tower over Telstra's plans to upgrade it to the 5G network. The protesters here are worried that radio signals from 5G towers could be damaging to their health. I don't want to be a human lab rat, you know, because that's what's happened. That they're just using us to see if, it can, if it's going to be OK. And if we die, well, we've got so many of us. Yeah, because I'm worried about our kids, the future. The, it's not proved yet the 5G is safe enough. To prevent Telstra's upgrade, activists have been maintaining a round-the-clock vigil at the tower for more than three months. Guarding the tower tonight is Sherry Yeomans and her dog Bundy. Well, basically, we're here protecting the tower to stop Telstra moving in with the cherry picker. We know they need the cherry picker to upgrade to 5G. So there's quite a team of us um, tag teaming a couple of hours, four hours or overnight to protect the tower from any works occurring. Activists claimed a victory in March when the local council passed a resolution calling for a halt to the upgrade. For now, Telstra has stopped work on the tower. 
I think for Telstra to roll out the, the installation of 5G during a pandemic in Mullumbimby, um, you know, it was, it was it, I'm sure they thought they were very clever doing that, but um, I think it was a really bad move and I think it really played into people's paranoia around this and, you know, into the conspiracy theory and that, you know, this is all a, a move to, you know, to institute a technology that, that um, is potentially harmful. Telstra's tower at Mullumbimby is just one of thousands of sites being upgraded to 5G across the country. Australia's telecommunications companies are spending billions of dollars building networks that they say will transform how we live and work, with no risk to our health. Here on the Gold Coast, Telstra has built an innovation centre to show off what 5G can do. What we're looking at here is a 5G device. So with a 4G device, we're talking about downloading an HD movie in minutes. But this is 5G technology and we're using... Chana Senavaratna is driving Telstra's 5G rollout. What we can do is download an HD movie in seconds. So minutes versus seconds. That's kind of the difference between the two technologies. And is that absolutely how fast this is going to ever get? Look, this is only the beginning. Uh, it's going to be twice, three times faster than this in the next few years. 5G promises a future where everything is high speed and interconnected. From autonomous vehicles to fight bushfires, to hyper-efficient agriculture and remote surgery. Just imagine a paramedic with the 5G technology. You could, for example, have the paramedic using a pair of, um, you know, augmented reality glasses. So what that paramedic sees, you could transmit back to a specialist back in the hospital. The, that person can then look at the patient as if they were there. They can provide advice. They could even send an instruction, which you could be displayed on a heads-up screen. And that's the kind of thing which you can do in real time on 5G, which you can't today do on 4G. 5G is not just about phone calls and ever-increasing resolution of videos. It's going to unlock the Internet of Things. And this is where machines start talking to machines. And this is going to allow a whole revolution in the way we, we live and organise ourselves. For example, the smart city. We can start coordinating traffic flow, which is going to have safety benefits, is going to have emission benefits, and beyond traffic is going to be coordinating air conditioning in buildings, coordinating lighting in buildings, uh, all sorts of things when machines start sensing the environment and actions can be taken. To deliver the fastest speeds, phone companies need to use higher frequency signals, known as millimetre waves. But millimetre wave signals can't travel as far as existing signals. So for it to work, there's a need for many more antennas installed much closer together. We would deploy millimetre wave in a CBD, for example, where there is a lot of traffic. What it would probably look like is you would probably see a cell site in most street corners. But because it is at that high frequency, the antennas themselves are very small and almost invisible. At the heart of the health concerns expressed by 5G activists is what's called radio frequency radiation, emitted by everything from radios, TVs and microwave ovens to Wi-Fi networks and mobile phones. Activists fear that more antennas mean more of this radiation and that it will cause problems ranging from anxiety to epilepsy and brain cancer. Do we want this? Do we want these towers blighting our landscape? Do we need more radiation? Do we want driverless cars? Who's asked for this? There's been no consultation. We are going to be in a, a radiation soup that we cannot opt out of. So at the moment, we have choices. Once uh, 5G is, is implemented, we no longer have any choice. We are in a soup of radiation that we cannot escape. The voice current, or the audio frequency current, as it comes from the transformer, is amplified by vacuum tubes, such as these. 
concerns about radiation have been around for more than a hundred years. In such a manner as to produce waves which travel through the air. Doctors first wrote about what they called radiophobia as early as 1903 to describe people who were afraid of radio speakers. Yet anxieties about power lines have... In the 80s, it was the radiation emitted by power lines. They're invisible and just about everywhere. Do we play Russian roulette with people's children? Should you be taking steps to keep your kids away from electromagnetic fields? Microwave cooking units, like those in the NASA Lunar Receiving Laboratory... There was a very big community concern when microwave ovens came out. Keep your eye on the chocolate cupcake. It rises faster than you can eat it. There was concern that food being cooked in it would be poisonous. This is cooking by microwave cooking without heat. When mobile phones came out, there was concern in the public. Uh, as we moved from first generation to second generation, or 2G phones, from 2G to 3G, 3G to 4G, and now 4G to 5G, uh, we, we tend to get another wave of concern from the public. And, and that's not linked to important changes to what the actual technology is doing. So the actual physical agent, the radiation that's being emitted by these devices is essentially the same as it's always been. And essentially the same as, as we've had around with radio, for instance, AM and FM radio for many years. If I just get you to hold on to the front of the cap while I get the rest of it arranged. Rodney Croft is chairman of the key international body that recommends safe exposure limits for radio frequency radiation. This is one of the most researched physical agents in the world. There are just thousands and thousands of papers out there that have gone into everything from epidemiology of cancer to simple, does it make you feel bad, agitated, um, cause you symptoms of any, any form. Perfect. OK, now what I'm going to do is get you to do the memory task that we were doing before. I'm going to leave the room. At his lab at Wollongong University, Rodney Croft runs tests on the effects of radio frequency radiation on humans. This test is simulating the radiation emitted by mobile phones. What we're really doing is setting people up, putting electrodes on their head, looking at the brain activity, the electrical activity caused by the brain and whether it's being influenced by the mobile phones. When we started, we were looking for large changes in the brain, thinking it, it could be a real problem, but we just don't find those. We don't see any changes in brain cancer, which is something that uh, we often hear activists uh, complain about. Uh, and, uh, well, there's probably thousands of claims out there and uh, none of them have actually uh, bore any fruit in terms of being able to demonstrate that there is an adverse health effect due to mobile phone usage. Some people also say that, particularly with 5G millimetre wave technology, there is concern because it will mean more antennas all over the place and therefore more radiation out in the atmosphere that we will be exposed to. What do you think about that claim? Uh, so far the research suggests that it's just not the case. Uh, generally what, what you do is you have more antennas so that you can reduce the, ex reduce the actual exposure. Um, the further you are from an antenna, the more the antenna has to work, the more energy it has to pump into the environment. So tests comparing, for instance, uh, the latest rollout of 5G against 4G finds very similar levels. And I must say the levels are generally um, about uh, 100 to 1,000 times lower than are permitted by the guidelines. They're exceedingly small. Sean, this is one of our labs, and we're the it's only amazing. company here in Australia that can do mobile phone um, testing, radiation testing, for manufacturers. This lab in Melbourne tests how much radio frequency radiation is emitted by devices like mobile phones, using highly specialised equipment that mimics a human body. This setup here represents or it's simulating a human head. We've put down a mobile phone at the bottom of the table here. That represents the ear, it, the phone's touching the ear. And we've got this liquid that simulates the body mass and tissue within our head. And 
This probe is going in at different parts of our head and measuring radio frequency energy coming out of the mobile phone and how much of that is being absorbed by our body tissue. Why do you need to do this test? This is the test that mobile phone manufacturer need to do to make sure that radio frequency energy coming out of their phone is meeting the Australian government rules and regulation and limits set for those sort of energies. So in other words, to make sure the phones are safe? Absolutely, to make sure that the phones are safe to be used by general population. Humans are commonly exposed to two types of radiation. Ionising radiation, which includes X-rays, and non-ionising radiation, which includes the radio frequency emissions from mobile phones or the 5G network. We know that ionising radiation uh, causes a lot of health effects, not just cancer, but other effects as well. So, you know, that's clearly something that people would be concerned about. Now, radio frequency is in what's called the non-ionising uh, uh, wavelengths of, uh, of radiation. So it doesn't cause, you know, DNA damage uh, uh, to genetic material and so on. So, but I think people hear radiation and uh, they think that, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's, that could potentially be harmful. The science of radio frequency radiation is highly contentious. Much of the concern stems from a landmark 2011 review by the World Health Organization, looking at previous studies of the effects of mobile phone radiation. Malcolm Sim was one of the authors. We were invited uh, from all different parts of the world to come together to review all of the scientific evidence uh, in, our, in our particular area of expertise. So my, my area was primarily the human studies that had been performed. The WHO routinely evaluates and classifies substances that can cause cancer. A group one classification means carcinogenic to humans. It includes alcohol and tobacco. Group 2A means probably carcinogenic and includes red meat and very hot drinks. Group 2B is possibly carcinogenic and includes things like car exhaust, but also some contraceptive pills and pickled vegetables. The expert panel decided to classify radio frequency radiation in Group 2B. Our group concluded that taking the human evidence and the animal evidence together, there was limited evidence of radio frequency causing cancer in humans. I mean, you've got a whole lot of scientists from around the world, each with their own perspective on the data, and uh, often they'll have their own interpretation. And uh, so there was not universal agreement about it being uh, classified as, as Group 2B. Uh, there, there was uh, some members of the group who were, um, thought it should be a, a lower classification than that, but the majority view was that uh, there should be, uh, it should be a, a Group 2B carcinogen. So it was picked up by a lot of media outlets at the time. And there was a strong sense that, yes, this meeting had shown that, yes, it was a cause, a cause of cancer in humans. But that wasn't justified? Well, I think it, you need to understand the, the way that these things are classified. So uh, this is, f from our point of view, of the people um, reviewing the evidence, it was very limited evidence. Uh, there, we've looked at other compounds where the evidence is incredibly strong and consistent and, uh, you know, there you're very worried about them as a cause of cancer. The WHO later issued information about managing the potential risk of mobile phone radiation. And so the approach at that time was for WHO to recommend a precautionary approach to take steps to reduce exposure. The main exposure is when it's very close to your head. So use a hands-free um, device, uh, use speakerphone, that sort of thing when using the phone. I don't think the classification was very significant. It's certainly been significant in terms of people's concern. To obtain that classification, they don't require any research to demonstrate that mobile phones actually cause cancer. What's required is that there is an association identified between cancer and mobile phone usage 
epidemiologically. That could mean one of two things. It could mean that there is an association related to mobile phone use, or it could just mean that there is a spurious association. And the subsequent research just hasn't shown that there is any relationship. The COVID-19 pandemic has supercharged the activism around the 5G rollout. In the centre of Sydney, anti-vaxxers, anti-lockdown activists, far-right conspiracy theorists and anti-5G campaigners have all united under the catch cry of freedom of choice. COVID-19 has caused an explosion in public awareness. Rather than meekly hunkering down under house arrest, men and women have taken to their computers and begun to ask questions, many of them for the first time. A registered nurse, Naomi Cook, helps run Australia's largest anti-5G Facebook group called Australians for Safe Technology. If you are not currently working to stop 5G, this means you don't understand it. Nothing else matters anymore. Yeah. Stop 5G! Stop 5G! Stop 5G! We know there is a much bigger and darker picture of play here. Well, we saw in the first two weeks of lockdown an explosion in group members. And I guess the most obvious reason for that is that people were at home and they had time to think and they had time to ask questions that perhaps they didn't have the headspace to do um, before that. And then through asking their own questions and doing their own research, perhaps some of them had the same concerns that we have about 5G and so they joined our groups. And what sort of numbers did you see? We went up from probably around 8,000 members to 40,000 in the first couple of weeks of lockdown. Naomi Cook's group is one of about 80 across Australia. It now has more than 48,000 members and is one of the world's largest anti-5G Facebook groups. You know, it's amazing. It's all been completely spontaneous, self-organised and grassroots. And so there's no kind of rule book that we go by, but it, what we do works. Um, we all respect each other. Um, there is no one single leader of this movement. We're, we're all leaders, you know, everyone is. Um, and yeah, so, you know, quite often someone will share something in one group, then it gets reshared in another group. Um, and yeah, awareness spreads. Recent posts include a strategy kit for how to lobby your doctor and local council over 5G. But members of the group also regularly share some of the most extreme conspiracy theories about 5G on the internet. This technology cooked your eyes like eggs in World War II. And you all need to understand these are military weapons these are assault frequencies. Naomi Cook was invited to speak about 5G at the Sydney rally, which was organised by an anti-vaccination group. So was the joint rally a deliberate strategy to make it look like far more people were interested <sighs> in each of the issues wow. than was actually the case? No. That's so sad. No, these were separate groups, each with very important issues that they were passionate about uniting on one day. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I mean, certainly, you know, in our groups, for example, we never said this was a 5G rally, you know. No, I don't think so. You'd have to be pretty dishonest to do something like that. So you don't think it was a strategy? No, I don't think it was any strategy. I didn't sniff out anything like that. Naomi Cook is now on the committee of a political party opposed to mandatory vaccination. And she's backing plans for a new anti-5G party. Our movement is growing all the time. So as our movement grows, having a political party almost creates, you know, a platform that may be conducive to bringing about change. So from that perspective, I, I think it's a very valid way to tackle the 5G problem. 
I think for the anti-5G groups, but also many other conspiracy theorists, a pandemic like this, a crisis like this, is very useful to draw attention to their causes because they can link the pandemic, in this case, with whatever their cause is, whether it's 5G, whether it's anti-vaccination, whether it's other uh, typical conspiracy stories. Um, so they can connect this um, crisis with whatever it is that they're focusing on and say, aha, we knew it all along, something was coming, here it is now. And so now you must listen to us because we've been correct all along. The coincidental arrival of COVID-19 and the rollout of 5G networks sparked one of the wildest conspiracy theories of all. The coronavirus was caused by 5G. Four Corners has tracked how the theory went viral around the world. The first known appearance of the conspiracy theory online was on January 19, when this was posted on Twitter. Disease in Wuhan city of 8.5 million people. Wuhan has 5,000 plus 5G base stations now and 50,000 by 2021. Is it a disease or is it 5G? When it was picked up just over a week later by the notorious far-right conspiracy website Infowars, it made the jump to a larger audience. 5G causes flu-like symptoms. Interesting. By February, the torrent of misinformation about coronavirus was so great, the United Nations branded it an infodemic. Fake news spreads faster and more easily than this virus and is just as dangerous. Within weeks, the 5G conspiracy theory gathered more steam when it was raised by controversial US doctor Thomas Cowan at an anti-vaccination conference. There has been a dramatic and quantum leap in the last six months with the electrification of the Earth. And I'm sure a lot of you know what that is. It's called 5G. Cowan was on probation after being found guilty in 2017 of unprofessional conduct by the Californian Medical Board. And I'll finish with anybody want to make one guess as to where the first completely blanketed 5G city in the world was. Exactly. So when you start thinking about this, we are in an existential crisis here, folks. Days later, this video of the lecture was promoted by US pop singer Kerry Hilson to her 4.2 million followers on Twitter. Then rapper Wiz Khalifa fueled the conspiracy theory with a tweet to his 36 million followers. Other celebrities shared the theory too, including Woody Harrelson, John Cusack and MIA. Celebrities really become super spreaders in all of this. They have millions, if not tens of millions of followers ver via their various social media accounts. And so once they start posting about these conspiracy theories, even critically, that makes them much more visible and reaches a, a much larger and more diverse audience. Hi, guys. Hello. Do you work for the NHS? Uh, no. Who do you work for? Soon, the conspiracy theory made the leap from online to the real world. You don't know the symptoms of it. It's a kill switch. Is this, is 5G it? technicians in the UK began reporting being abused and threatened with violence. But do you know what you're doing now? You're laying 5G? Yeah. You realise that, don't you? Yeah? Yeah. So what, you know that kills people? It's gone a four days, bro. That's gone a four days. Next, anti-5G activists began burning phone towers. 5G burning, bro. By early May, more than 70 mobile phone towers had been attacked in the UK and more than a dozen more across Europe, North America, New Zealand and Australia. I send a message out. 5G. F you government. F you new world order. Counter-terrorism police have been brought in following international attacks on phone towers linked to conspiracy theories that the 5G network spreads coronavirus. Another fire has caused extensive damage to a phone tower equipment in Adelaide South. 
At an anti-lockdown rally in Melbourne, 5G was again linked to coronavirus. Hello, everyone. Um, it prompted a sharp response from Australia's then Chief Medical Officer, Brendan Murphy. There's unfortunately a lot of very silly misinformation out there. There is absolutely no evidence about 5G uh, doing anything in the coronavirus space. I have not, unfortunately received a lot of communication from these conspiracy theorists myself. It is complete nonsense. 5G has got nothing at all to do with coronavirus. Four Corners investigations show the global spread of misinformation about 5G is no accident. There's growing concern more sinister players may be involved. And that hostile governments may have exploited the movement for their own interests. There is misinformation circulating about 5G, including the entirely fallacious claim that it has adverse health impacts and uh, more recently, the claim that it's linked in any way to COVID-19 or the coronavirus. And I'm making the related point that it is well accepted by commentators and experts in the subject of misinformation and disinformation that there are known state actors involved in uh, circulating and generating disinformation. And what sort of interests would that serve, do you think? Um, it, it creates division, it creates disruptions, it creates protests, it creates possibly more people uh, disobeying any lockdown orders, any social distancing orders. And of course, that then further um, damages uh, the economy, damage, damages the population in the first place by, by spreading the virus further. So it weakens ultimately the countries that they're addressing. The original tweet linking 5G to coronavirus came from an anonymous account that regularly posts pro-Russian government content. That tweet linked to an article by the Russian state-owned news outlet RT, formerly known as Russia Today. Is there a catch? There is, just a small one. It might kill you. <laughs> Good to know. RT America has enthusiastically broadcast widely discredited health fears about 5G. It just really sold to us as being awesome, but the downside is that with this rollout, it will be impossible to exist in a city or to walk outside without being exposed. Another source of anti-5G misinformation is conspiracy website Global Research which takes a relentlessly pro-Kremlin line. Australia's largest anti-5G Facebook group has shared articles published by Global Research, including one that claims 5G is a weapon system disguised as a consumer convenience and might be killing all the insects. I think we'd be naive if we did not recognise the possibility that some of these claims are being generated uh, by uh, hostile governments or by others who have a motive to try and create instability uh, and disorder in uh, democracies like Australia. Uh, we know that uh, disinformation and misinformation has been an issue in elections uh, in other countries, and so that cannot be ruled out, in my view, as a possible driver of some of this. So in particular, people have, in relation to this issue, have talked about Russia potentially being interested in doing that. Would you agree that that's a possibility? Look, I'm not going to be commenting on any uh, individual nation. I simply make the general point that it is pretty well accepted in the commentary and analysis on this issue uh, that there are uh, there's a high likelihood that state actors are involved. And when you look at something which is entirely without any scientific basis uh, and where there appears to be um, a systematic effort to try and uh, uh, raise concerns that are, in fact, without substance, uh, this appears to be what is occurring, or at least one of the factors in relation to uh, misinformation and disinformation in relation to 5G.
задача ближайших лет организовать повсеместный доступ к высокоскоростному интернету, начать эксплуатацию систем связи пятого поколения 5G. For the world's superpowers, 5G is developing into a critical technology arms race. The race to 5G is a race America must win, and it's a race, frankly, that our great companies are now involved in. We've given them the incentive they need. It's a race that we will win, because, as you know, some people got ahead of us. We should have been doing this a long time ago. In the race for technology dominance, a new leader is emerging. China is on the rise. If we think about a technological innovation, we think about U.S., Silicon Valley. And yet, there seems to be a sense that U.S. is not as competitive at the moment. There are communities in, in the U.S. thinking that China is eating U.S. America's lunch. Uh, it is losing technological advantage. It is losing markets. It is losing also influence. A 5G world dominated by China raises the terrifying prospect of it shutting down entire countries in times of conflict. What are the potential vulnerabilities for a country with 5G? Well, everything in our society uh, relies upon connected technologies, from our supermarkets to our electricity uh, generation and distribution, to our hospitals, our traffic lights, our banking and finance. That means if those technologies fail or are turned off, uh, that you would have catastrophic consequences. You would lose lives, there is no doubt, in the most extreme end of the scenario. The US's great rival, Russia, has chosen its side. Last year, Vladimir Putin announced a major deal with the Chinese tech giant Huawei to supply 5G equipment. There are unceremonious attempts at pushing Huawei from the global market. Some call it the first technological war of the new digital era. Huawei was founded by Chinese billionaire Ren Zhengfei, a former civil engineer with the People's Liberation Army. The company has grown to become a global leader in 5G technology, even showing off its prowess by rolling out 5G on Mount Everest. Whatever you say about Huawei, everyone knows that we are the world leader when it comes to 5G. We've spent billions of dollars in research and development. Uh, and by the time 5G came around, uh, we were a clear leader. But Huawei's attempts to break into the Australian 5G market were spectacularly dashed by the Turnbull government in August 2018. Chinese tech giant Huawei has been effectively banned from building Australia's 5G network because of national security concerns. Well, Australia banned high-risk vendors, vendors that are domiciled in high-risk countries, of which clearly China is one because of its national security laws that compel uh, organisations domiciled there to cooperate with and, and assist uh, their intelligence agencies. The reality is that if we were to have high-risk vendors from China, in this context, who provided our 5G technology, the technology that underpins the network and, in effect, builds the network, that would give them the capability, if they chose, to very seriously and gravely disrupt our, our economy and infrastructure, uh, uh, industrial activities, economic activities, financial activities. It's a, it is, it would be, it's a very, very profound capability. Central to the Australian government's concerns was a 2017 Chinese law that compels companies to support, provide assistance and cooperate in national intelligence work. If you believe that there is a risk that you could get into a uh, conflict, you know, a time of tension, a time of conflict where pressure may be sought to be brought upon you, 
then you've got to say, well, we'll just hedge there and we won't have those high-risk vendors providing 5G in Australia. So it's not identifying a smoking gun, it's identifying a loaded gun. We've had legal advice inside China and outside China that says that that law doesn't pertain to us, it's directed at operators rather than vendors. But even if it was, and we were asked by the Chinese government to do something, uh, to go against our customers, uh, you know, Ren, our founder, has said uh, he would say no. He would rather see the company fold overnight uh, than actually do anything to risk the uh, trust that we have by our customers. No matter what Huawei thinks, no matter what the management think, no matter what the spokes person that they send to talk to Four Corners thinks, they will not be making the decision. Ultimately, if the Communist Party leadership in Beijing decide they want Huawei or to want to use Huawei's capabilities in a manner that is adverse to Australia, it will happen. Australia was the first country in the world to ban Huawei from its 5G network. Huawei has blamed pressure from the United States. Mr Prime Minister, thank you very much. Thank you, The United States have been very public about their call for countries to ban Huawei. We know when Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull went to Washington in February of 2018, there's six months before the Huawei ban, the US uh, advised him that they did not want Huawei in Australia's 5G. I mean, they were so adamant in it, uh, it was leaked to the media at the time. So essentially they're saying you bowed yeah. to US pressure. Did you? No, so that, that, that is completely untrue. In fact, the 5G issue was raised by me uh, with the Americans. Uh, and that is that that is that is that assertion by Huawei is utterly false. It was raised by me when I was in discussions with the administration, and it was something that we made a point about. It was a, a matter of very keen interest to us. But I want to say the proposition that we were directed or advised to keep Huawei out of our network by the US. Uh, is simply not true. We convinced many countries... The US and the UK have now both banned Huawei from their 5G networks. Not to use Huawei. And Donald Trump is urging others to follow. It's an unsafe security risk. It's a big security risk. There's no US company that does wireless. So what we're seeing is the US asking countries to essentially pause and wait for a catch-up uh, because there's a gap between the US ability to do wireless technology and companies like Huawei. The West, really in an absence of mind, allowed its leadership in wireless technology to be lost. And that was a massive failure uh, of the West and particularly, obviously, in Washington, where they were, excuse the pun, asleep at the switch. The promise of 5G was to create a more connected world. Instead, one of the biggest technology revolutions in a century could leave the world even more divided. At the extreme, the concern is that this technological competition or tech war can result in so-called technological iron curtain where we have a technologically divided world where certain countries will use Chinese provided technology and others won't. So there will be a lot of disconnect. Pushing that Huawei ban is seen as, uh, in many countries, is seen as asking to choose sides. Do you want to be with Team US or you want to be with Team China? These concerns are a long way from the front line of the other 5G war. Activists in Mullumbimby are still determined to keep 5G out of their town. And at the Telstra Tower, the vigil goes on. We're not putting a time limit on this. Ideally, we would like something concrete from Telstra saying there won't be any works happening. That's basically what we're waiting for at this point in time. So you're willing to wait as long as it takes? Absolutely, we're not going anywhere. You know, we're here and we're not going anywhere. Mm.